What's up, No Nation? It's the guys from Plant the Spear back with you for another episode. And Michael, we got a bunch of stuff, a bunch of movement to Let's talk go. about today. The lawsuit is heating up with Florida State and the ACC. Of course, you got Clemson involved now. There's some pretty cryptic messaging going on in this latest filing by oh, Florida yeah. State that we're going to get into that I think is even more interesting than the developments that have happened in North Carolina, which we'll talk about as well. Then, of course, football is a third of the way through spring camp already. Seems like it's flying by. They just had their first scrimmage. We'll talk about some notes and takeaways that we had from the first scrimmage, from the things we've been able to read. And then I want to talk a few minutes on baseball's bounce back we know kind of we haven't talked to you since that clemson series it was a little That's bit right. rough but they bounced back in a big way which was huge yeah, to see so we're gonna jump into it got a fully loaded episode for you guys today but first michael how are you my friend thank you for joining me for another episode uh thanks for having me jesse so good everything's uh you know on the up and up super excited for where the baseball team to see them bounce back man that was a was a great bounce back to beat florida and jacksonville there and 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 not just beat them but i mean they put a whooping on them right and, Run uh, run ruled them right and so that was really great as well um and uh lot, lots of stuff happening so man let's get into it right all right so let's first start with this this lawsuit update you know this is like watching court tv you're just kind of <laughs> tuned in waiting for something to happen so far no one's jumped over the bench like that one guy and attacked the judge so we don't have any like crazy action like that it's mostly just paperwork shuffling back and forth but this latest filing by florida state yep was pretty interesting there is a lot of good things in there now first let's back the train up and talk about what happened in north carolina so what about a week or so ago yep. they had the initial hearing for jurisdiction in north carolina in mecklenburg county in charlotte and they heard the arguments from both sides they're still waiting on the judge's decision now they did say that it should be decided whether to dismiss the north carolina case or get a stay in that which basically just kicks the can down the road uh, so the leon county case can proceed that decision should be made by April the 9th. So that, that is when the Leon County case is supposed to start. So you should have a, a decision there. Now, from what I've heard most of the lawyers say, and again, as we say in every show, we are not lawyers. This is our interpretation of, right. of what we've read from the case. And, and pretty much just about every podcast in the world has had the same couple of lawyers on to talk about it. And right. they do a great service for the community explaining it. But this is our Twitter lawyer uh, <laughs> or, or YouTube lawyer <laughs> interpretation. But it sounds like, FSU may not get the case dismissed in North Carolina. There is, you know, they they said that the ACC actually had some pretty good arguments. They had a little bit more of a veteran lawyer up there on their side arguing the case, and he, he made some good points. But I think that the stay is going to be on the table because what Florida State wants to do, and this ties into the Leon County filing, Florida State wants to get to the discovery phase. That's really what they're aiming to do. Because we've talked about this before, where the ACC basically treats every document like the Declaration of Independence. Like you, you have to go on whatever that movie. Like it's not Mission Impossible, but whatever the movie was, where they go and try and steal it or whatever. Like it, it's just to just to see the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, National it's, treasure. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's crazy. Like I'm sorry, movie people. I'm not a big movie person. So I blanked <laughs> on that one. But. but you know, the, the thing is, they keep everything so secret. And, and right. I think what's smart for Florida State is they argued in North Carolina as well, as, as well as Leon County, that you are basically asking the court to make an interpretation on a document that the court doesn't have, Correct. that they haven't seen. They've seen like 13 of the hundred and something pages that are involved or whatever. And so they basically are, are challenging the court to say, you need to allow us to get to this discovery phase so everybody can at least be on level ground so we can right. know what we're arguing so you can know what you're interpreting the ACC is the only one that knows right. so to me that I mean it just makes perfect sense because this whole ACC dealing the way they do business is, is sketchy to begin with super sketch and so that's really where things are in North Carolina they're just kind of deciding to, you know the judge is taking in all the information deciding on a few things and like I said the Leon County thing was a little more interesting because that's where you get to that discovery that's phase right. because again and we'll talk further about this I got a bunch of notes for you guys but we'll talk about this further down the line but the reason the Leon County case is so important is if it makes it to discovery phase these documents have to be opened according right. to Florida law so yes. if they can if they can get to this if they can allow this discovery phase to happen in Florida all these things have to be unsealed and so Correct. like everybody then is fighting on fair ground right right absolutely well and the thing is you know, one of the things that the FSU attorneys you know were arguing is that you know 
the judge, like even to this day, even to this point in the North Carolina case, the ESPN agreement, uh, I think the judge is Blitzo. He still has not seen it yet. He's still right. waiting to get this document. But ESPN and, and the ACC are arguing that this should be kept confidential. But the thing is, is and especially in this Leon uh, County case uh, par- portion of this, is FSU is arguing like we are bound by Florida State sunshine law. We cannot keep this confidential. The law requires that FSU, the university, the board of trustees of the university, we're, they're required to disclose and make public these documents. And so the ACC is trying to circumvent all the different ways to try to keep this document um, under wraps. And so they, so they, so FSU's attorney accused them of, of deception, basically saying that they're, that, in the line of the of the agreement that they're saying, oh, like, you know, the, the uh, FSU is supposed to try to keep this confidential and they're required to. And FSU is arguing like, no, 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 no. You're not stating the, the provision in the contract or in the uh, agreement correctly. Like, this is wrong. You're basically flat out lying. Like you're you're dismissing the fact that we're required by Florida state law to actually show this to 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 make this public. And so, man, you you got. You know, that North Carolina case was, you know, kind of bland and they were going back and forth and whatnot. But this Leon case has got a little bit more juicy. I mean, because Florida State is all in on calling the ACC and its mama and its grandma all kinds (laughs) of things. Right. And I think what's important, too, you hinted at something that I think is really important in this case. And so I think what, what first we have to understand with the grant of rights, right? The grant of rights technically only applies to your home games yep. while you are a, a member Never. of the conference. So right. your home games only. So that means this is what's interesting about this argument is the ACC got into business with a school in Florida, two of them, if you count Miami, but that's mm-hmm. irrelevant at this point, but you engaged in business with a, a school in the state of Florida, knowing that they have these laws and Correct. being that the grant of rights only applies to your home games. It basically is only relevant to business that happens in Florida. Correct. So how could you not expect them to have to fl- follow Florida state statute and, and make these documents open to the public? So that I think is what really the basis that Florida state is standing on. Like you knew coming into this, you were doing business in the state of Florida. You knew the laws in the state of Florida and you know that this is part of the dealings. And so they're just trying to argue that we're just trying to follow the law. We're not doing any, we didn't violate any confidentiality stuff. Of course, the ACC really is just saying that they don't want their trade secrets to get out right. and, and things like that. And I get it. There's probably some things in there that they don't want to expose as far as how they negotiate things. I understand that, too. But I think most of us believe, to be honest, it's not the trade secrets that they're trying to hide. Because no. how are you like the worst <laughs> negotiated conference? And yet you're hi- what trade secrets are you hiding from the Correct. from the worst TV deal ever? And so I, I think that they're trying to hide some of the skeletons in the closet. And so they don't want to get to discovery phase. And I think that, again, Florida State is just arguing that they're following the law. Now, right. so also what you said, they are accusing the ACC of misrepresentations of their own documents to the court. Right. And so this is another really massive point in this lawsuit because really what they're doing. And, and so some of the notes I have just to, to kind of uh, point in this direction is they argue that there's something that that has been brought up in court called the commercially reasonable efforts that started in North Carolina. It's a clause that the ACC basically said in, in a kind of heavily redacted version, they quoted s- only snippets of this clause that they basically, their hand was forced to sue FSU. And that's why they opened the lawsuit ahead of time. They they did it in a way that didn't need two thirds of the vote. That was a, um, in an affidavit by James Ryan, who is the chairman of the ACC board of directors. So the judge in North Carolina was basically like, okay, let me see the whole thing. Let me see this clause. Let me see it in writing. And when they produced it, it was not what the ACC was telling them that it was. So what they're saying is they have not really been truthful with their information that they've divulged so far. So why should you trust them in the future if you don't even have the documents that you're arguing about and they have already proven to not be truthful with the documents that they're interpreting for you? Why should you take their word for it? So that's why Florida State says we need all this out in the open. And I think that that's what's interesting is some of the quotes that they said. 
it, they said this is out of their a quote out of their out of their ten page filing in Leon County. These is incidents talking about the deception bring into sharp focus the ACC's game of hide the ball must end. The lawyers wrote. <laughs> so I think that that is is important because they're trying. Basically, it says the ACC's motion to stay discovery must be denied and discovery must be instead accelerated. And then they went on to say five words explain why the motion should be denied. The motion to stay by the ACC in Leon County to get to the truth. And so I think it's basically they're just saying, listen, no matter what's in here, whether it's good for us or bad for us, we right. all need to know so we can right. all be arguing in the same court with right. the same document. And so that that's important. Now, there's a couple other notes that I think are, are really relevant to talk to here. Uh, you know, go through. But, man, that that's a pretty big one there. Just looking at some of those things where the ACC has been deceptive. And and you kind of got them on record now. You know, you yeah. caught them with liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, and there's, yeah. There's, there's some smoking pants in the oh. ACC's corner. <laughs> the pants are on fire. I mean, they they <laughs> they if FSU has caught them in a in a in like you said a game of hide the ball. Basically, the ACC and their lawyers have been trying to hide this thing, and they keep moving where they're hiding it because for some reason they do not want the the member the member schools to have access to this document because i honestly and this is speculation again like jesse said we're not lawyers we, we're not expert here we're basically youtube you know like uh court watchers are basically right exactly um, but i i think there are things in that document that will reveal the lack of integrity it will re yep. reveal their mishandling of the negotiation it will basically reveal what fsu started the argument with is what is that the acc did not do its fiduciary duty to represent the conference well there's no way that a power five school like the acc should have such a terrible deal like uh, a worse deal than the SEC and the Big Ten. Like, where, why, why did, why is the ACC in this deal? Why are we taking less money? I mean, case in point, just look at the recent college football playoff um, uh, uh, funds distribution agreement right, that, right. that the ACC just agreed to only take 17% and the SEC and the Big Ten are taking 29%. How did we negotiate that? Like, and I think this deal will reveal much more of that, which will then give more leverage to FSU to whittle down the penalty or because it is a penalty. Let's just call it what it is right, and right. to whittle down the, the grant of rights access to it. And what FSU and the, and the other key part about this is that what FSU is arguing, which has been made very clear, is this idea. They've said several different times that. If FSU leaves the ACC, then the ACC no longer has rights to the Florida property because it's no longer a conference institution. So you see very clearly that FSU uh, early on, FSU had this kind of posture of, you know, if the ACC were to change its uh, fund distribution to like reward like Clemson and Florida State more heavily, then there's a possibility that FSU would stay. They've made it very clear now that they are leaving this conference and they are going to make sure they burn it down on the way out. <laughs> right. And, and I think that's important, man, because they're kind of leaning there. I don't want to say borrowing, but they're kind of leaning into the, into the yes. lawsuit that Clemson filed. Yes. Where it's like, look, yes. you can do whatever you want with us while we're here, but once we're out of this conference, we're no longer a member. And so you don't control our rights at that point. And so that's, that's an argument that they're kind of tying into the Clemson lawsuit, which yeah. I think is, is really important as well. And yeah, man, I, I think, like you said, with all the Swafford stuff that goes back, I think you're going to see some business dealings yep. get exposed that they don't want yep. to get exposed. And, and, you know, once you get to this phase, this discovery phase, you might have depositions for people who are in really, really high level positions that don't want to have to go on here and, and say things or, you know, you can't lie under oath. That's perjury. <laughs> yes. So, like, I, I don't think they want it to get the discovery phase. So I think that's where you get your your settlement talks to start to accelerate. Now, yeah. I did hear a lawyer say something about they can unseal the records for court purposes. So, like, me and you may never get to see it. Right. But at least everyone who's arguing the case law and Correct. the judge and all that stuff, they will get to see it. Yeah. So it's huge, man. And then, like you said, with the, the change of the verbiage of what they're saying, initially it was kind of like, look, if you can find a way to make everybody happy, Maybe we'll we can hang out for yeah. right. We'll we'll hang out for a little bit. You know right. what I mean? We're, we're here until we're not. Right now, it's like, yeah, man. There's no repairing this. Now nah, we we're, done. We're, like we're out of here. It, it's divorce time. We're, FSU we're, woke up. FSU woke up the other day and chose violence. Basically, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so I think the one of the last things on the lawsuit that was big that that 
I don't know. Maybe you guys knew this. I really, I didn't, I was unaware of this until I was doing some research. I was on another show yesterday talking about conference realignment from an FSU position. And this is something I wasn't even aware of. So they also argue in the, that the ACC was kind of beating around the bush, not really being fully truthful when they when they were arguing the right of Jim Phillips to unilaterally grant yes. ESPN four additional years yep. to pick up that 2027 extension. Now, of course, we knew about the 2027 extension. I, I guess I had missed the, the note where he gave them that four-year extension. Yes, he did. Yep. And so I think what's really important, and this is something I talked about on that show yesterday, is Knowing that 2025, that February 2025 date. Now, first off, let, let's let's put in a couple crucial dates here. So August 15th is the date that Florida State has to put has in to. writing that they want to leave the conference for to the next out. year. Right, to be right. out by 2025. Right. Yeah. So, like, if we say on August 15th, which, by the way, is my birthday, so I'm hoping for a really good birthday present. Um, you know, from, from come on, Florida State. Uh, <laughs> you know, give me what I want. But – so if they file for that date, they'll be in there next year, right? Yeah. So that's an important date to remember. Also, that 2027 date is important to remember. But I think what's really interesting about that 2025 date, now that I, you know, I get to thinking about it, that is when ESPN pretty much has to pick up this extension. And yep. this extension has not been picked up yet, which is one concerning already. But yep. we know legal stuff tends to drag out. This could drag out for a really long time. But with that 2025 date, and I believe it's February that they have to decide, ESPN is probably going to want to know what they're signing an extension for. So I don't think they're going to want to push this past that 2025 date because why would you sign an extension at a current rate without Florida State and Clemson, the two biggest brands in there? So to me, I think that is that is really important, Yeah, a, a date to really focus in on because – why would you sign that extension if there's no Florida State and Clemson in the ACC? Right. And if well, they don't pick up that extension, the ACC is essentially dead. Now, there are two ways to look at this. In 2027, if that extension – let's just say Florida State's stuck in, in the ACC, at least until 2027. That's another date that's crucially important because, you know, here's the other thing that Florida State argues in this lawsuit, that if that extension is not picked up, there are no guaranteed grant of rights for their media there's no monetization uh, nope. monetization there yeah past 2027 so we would essentially be out max date 2027 if they don't yep. pick it up but i think what's important too is in 2027 if they don't pick this up i i think it's this is very much a gamble it could be good it could be bad because the acc will then find themselves in a pac-12 situation where now you can go to open market and shop your rights you have things like apple streaming amazon so you know, you could go out and find a, a better deal, but you're running the risk of the Pac-12. They they shopped. No, there was no one buying. The so best now they, deal they got was $20 million. Right. So now they don't have a deal. So I think while it could be good, it's also a gamble. And I think Florida yeah. State's like, look, the SEC and the Big Ten are not a gamble. No. So we don't want to wait for that date. But, man, that that – that four year, that four additional years is also a hinge point in this case where if he didn't have the rights to do that, it could kind of really swing things around in Florida State's direction. But at the same time, man, that's a huge date because I don't think ESPN is going to want to sign a, a, an agreement without knowing what they're signing and the teams that are involved. Yeah, well, y y you're saying you're saying you don't think ESPN will want to sign a deal without knowing the teams are involved. I'm saying ESPN don't want to sign a deal regardless. I was about to say, they don't want to sign it right now, but they, they don't want to sign it right now, it, right? right? And here's why I believe that, because – they just signed a $3.8 billion deal with the SEC, right? And so they are stretched thin. Everybody knows. If, you think, if you've been paying any attention to college football, any attention to ESPN, any attention to the economics uh, right now in, in our world, everybody has heard that, that ESPN is bleeding money. From Disney because right. Disney owns ESPN and they're stretched so thin and they're trying to figure out how to go, you know, product straight to consumer without all these third party distribution models. That's why they're working with the Big Ten. That's why they're working with. I mean, I'm sorry, not Big Ten with Fox. ESPN is bleeding money. So why would they want to continue to sign a product that basically is costing them, you know, all this money, almost four four to five hundred million dollars a year when they could just invest that money into the prime product, according to them, which is the SEC. So I don't believe ESPN is going to sign the deal regardless. FSU and Clemson could stay in the conference. And I just don't think it, I just don't believe it. I think 
This is a two-sided war for ESPN. They're putting up a front for the ACC because they're legally obligated to because they're in contracts right now, right? Mm -hmm. But I also think behind closed doors, they're all rooting for FSU and Clemson to get out of this so they can, so they can get out of the deal because – in 2025, that deal comes up for renewal. The ESPN is like, sorry guys, yeah, we got better. We got we our girl that we got a prettier girl down the road there. <laughs> exactly. That's what we're focusing on, right? Um, and uh, I just don't think ESPN wants to sign the deal. Now, again, this is my speculation. I have no inside knowledge whatsoever. I it, it just seems like the writing has been on the wall for that. And so FSU has recognized that. I don't think FSU is dumb. They see they've seen the tea leaves on this thing. And so they're smart enough to try to get ahead of this. Clemson's smart enough, finally, thanks for joining the, the fight, uh, to get ahead of this as well, too. Yeah, and I think UNC is going to get in that fight, too. And and I think you're right, man. To be honest, I think this may be like ESPN is is defending their little brother, you know, because right. they have to. Mm -hmm. or, or like their kid. Yeah, but they yeah, secretly yeah. don't like that kid. You know what I mean? They're like, he's not really good at sports. He, you know, he can't play any instruments. But the all star over here, yeah, the SEC, yeah. like this may be their scapegoat way of killing off right. the ACC, or right. at least unloading it as, as right. a property. They may sell that off to the CW or something like that. Right. Because if you know, if you don't have Clemson or Florida State, that might be your only shopping right. option there. Right, is for a smaller network like that. But I think that really is important. And one thing that we talked about on that show yesterday is like, where does FSU end up? The, the yeah. Big Ten or the SEC? Where does everybody want to end up? And and where do you think the most likely spot is? And and I know initially I said the SEC kind of seems like a tough landing spot when you're you're literally in litigation with them right now. But right. I think it also might be easier to negotiate mm -hmm. a move with the company that basically already owns your media rights. They may just right. be like, hey, look, we'll just. We'll move you guys who are unhappy here over to the SEC. We'll let you go because, I mean, again, there's half the teams in the ACC probably don't have a landing spot. They're just not mm -hmm. desirable. Right. Where Florida State and Clemson are, UNC is, teams like maybe Virginia could be. Right. But I think that it may be kind of that backdoor way for them to unload this. Now, I think yeah. uh, I know a lot of people don't want to continue to deal with ESPN. They'd rather be in the Big Ten. I understand that argument. ESPN owns the playoffs. I mean, you kind of can't get around dealing with ESPN. So, you know, obviously I think, I think most people want to go to the SEC. I think we're accepting of going to the big 10 because it's not ESPN. It's more money. It's a right. bigger conference. And so I just took a couple of numbers that I thought were interesting as we round out the lawsuit update, why Florida state I think is, is so desirable because you know, you hear a lot of these people talk about like like Miami jumps on the ACC bandwagon because I don't think they have a landing spot right they now. They don't. They I don't. really don't. And then so so some people will talk about well, Florida State isn't as as desired as they think they are. Well, yeah, they kind of are because mm, when you look at some yeah. of these numbers, at the end of the day, everything that has to do with all these dealings in college football realignment, all that stuff, we know is controlled by TV networks, ESPN, right. Fox. That it's all about That's eyes it. on the TV sets. They don't necessarily care if you're good. They care right. if you win. They took UCLA to the Big Ten. I mean, that's they right. You know, they they don't want anything in a really long time. So it's like they took them because of the market, the TV that's market right. that they're in. And so first off, you know, people will say like, okay, the SEC, they already have Florida. You know, maybe the Big Ten could go get Florida State or Miami or something like that. Well, first off, Florida has 22 million, almost 23 million people in that state. If you divide that audience up, there is enough room to support oh. more than one team. And I know that same argument applies to South Carolina with Clemson and, and USC or U of SC. I don't know how many factors to call it USC, <laughs> but they only have five and a half million people in South Carolina. It's a very small rural state. Right. I live here myself. So it's like, you know, I, I think Florida is a big enough audience that you want to plant your flag in there if you're the Absolutely. Big Ten. And if you're the SEC, you want to continue to control that market. But just looking, I went and did some research on some TV numbers for Florida State that I, I found really interesting from 2023. First off, they were top 10 in most viewed teams in 2023 with a 3.58 million viewer average. Uh, Clemson came in 22nd at 1.7 million. And the next in the ACC was Louisville, who had a good season at 31st at 1.36 million. So the thing that was interesting with those numbers is, first off, you see when Florida State's good, they are the top of the ACC. Yep. When they were bad, we know about the numbers that came out from like 2014 to 2022 when they struggled. They were still number two. Clemson doesn't seem to really have a lot of that sticking power. You had that nine and four season and your numbers dropped from they were at 2.59 million in 22 
to now 1.7 million. So right. they had a, a massive drop. Now, the other thing is when the 4 million club, which is where you have a game that peaks with over 4 million viewers, it's like a benchmark in the TV world. Last year, Florida State had five games that topped 4 million. Duke had wow. three, Clemson had two, Miami had two, Louisville had one. But here's what's interesting. Every four plus million game involved Clemson, Florida State, or Notre Dame. Mm. So again, if you strip those three brands from the conference, it's going to be tough. It's and done. It, was, it was the same thing in 2022. So Florida State had two of the top 25 most viewed games of the season, and it would have been three with the ACC championship game, but that the ancillary networks are not counted in the, in the Nielsen ratings. And yeah. so it was on ACC network. I found those numbers independently. So again, you would have had three of the most top 25 viewed games. So they bring numbers. Now you also have to imagine that is competing against ACC teams that don't have the viewership that don't right. travel well to other stadiums that don't do all of those things. And so I went and looked at a couple of things that I find interesting where you talk about the desirability of Florida state for these other conferences. So Florida state has played in the last two years, and I know you're, I'm kind of using when they're at at least decent level, right, 10 wins right. or more. So Florida State has played five games against the SEC in 2022 and 2023. LSU twice, Florida twice, and of course we know the Orange Bowl, uh, which we choose to forget. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but for what it's worth, that Orange Bowl was, uh, I think the, the it was, I got some notes on it, but it, it was really, really high in that Orange Bowl. Uh, it was the most viewed non-playoff bowl game and the most viewed Orange Bowl since 2017, even knowing the sham that it was. But anyway, yeah. back to my point. FSU averaged, I said earlier, 3.58 million viewers on the season in the ACC against SEC competition alone. Mm. With the Orange Bowl thrown in there, they averaged 8.76 million Ooh. viewers against SEC competition. 7.13 if you just count regular season games and not the Orange Bowl. I mean, you can see that they are the driver. If they were yeah. to play SEC competition every week, week in and week out, or even Big Ten competition, those numbers would skyrocket. And again, yeah. it's all about that. Even I, I went and looked at the ACC championship game. Florida State versus Louisville drew 7.3 million viewers, which was Jeez. the second most watched ACC championship game since 2014. Michael, who played in that game in 2014? Mm, Florida State. I, I thought so. And so that was at, <laughs> that was at 10.1 million viewers. <laughs> The and it was the fourth highest ever, uh, the the one this year. So the only other one between 2014 and now that topped that was in 2020 when you had a rematch between Clemson and Notre Dame, both top three teams, playoff implications on the line, no one could attend, so everybody had to watch it on TV. That's right. Also, didn't include an ACC team. That's right. So there's another thing there, and they had, they had 10.18 million viewers. So only two ACC championship games since 2014 had over 7 million viewers, and four of them were under 5 million. In mm. the one since 2009, or 2008, excuse me, the one time an ACC championship game did not feature either Florida State or Clemson was 2021 when Pitt played Wake Forest, had 2.5 million viewers. <laughs> Like I think our our like a Thursday night game against Wake Forest draws two and a half million. Two and a half million, yeah. So like it just it goes to show why they would be desirable. Now, if you look at TV viewers from 2016 to 2022, Florida State would have been fifth in the Big Ten, and again mm. that's playing ACC competition mm. with a bunch of down years. If you count just 2023, they would have been third in the mm. SEC. They would have been tenth. 2023 alone, they would have been fifth. Mm. So, man, I just think, like, you can certainly see the fit. Yes. You can see the draw. Yes. You can see why these other conferences, based on those TV numbers, why they want Florida State, because it yeah. is a huge brand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> if you go back and look at any of the ACC schools outside of Clemson, okay? So, outside of Clemson. So, you go Wake, Boston College, Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, you know, Pitt, uh, you know, all those other schools, NC State. And you look at when they played Florida State. I bet you that their viewership was the highest it's been playing Florida State. Yep. <clears throat> I bet you that's when it happened because they don't get any other kind of viewership until they play Florida State. Remember when Wake Forest tried to, uh, their AD tried to say yeah. they're the fastest growing whatever viewership fan base in the country? That's only because they were playing Florida State. Those right. numbers were come from playing Florida State. Florida State is the draw in the ACC. Now, Clemson. Yes, over the last, what, six, seven years, Clemson has been a draw. 
But let's talk about Clemson before they started winning national championships. They were right. nothing. Right. And Florida State and the what we call the lost years, even when they were, you know, not winning but eight games, seven games, you know, Bobby was uh, uh, trending downward. They were still the best draw, the biggest draw. And you just said it. They would have been fifth in 2022 in the SEC and third in the Big Ten. Why do you think they would want that? Florida State. I guarantee you, if they go into the SEC, yes, the SEC already has a foothold in Florida with the University of Florida. But to add FSU means that then the SEC gets to go back to the ESPN and say, look, we just brought in your best draw. They're literally ranked fifth. You're going to have to pay us more money. And the Big Ten would say, oh, well, now we have a national. They already have a national conference. They're just missing the South, uh, right. the Southeast. And if they could get Florida State, holy cow, that's way more money. And the yep. SEC right now, over the next, I think, what, seven years, the, the Big Ten is projected to pay almost $90 million out to schools, and, and the SEC is projected to pay $80 million. So if the Big Ten can get FSU, they're probably looking at $100 million yeah. per year per school. Right, and that's something that we were talking about on that, on that other show was how a lot of these – the gaps, the revenue gaps that we talk about haven't even really been figured down the road. Now that you've added a lot of huge brands to the big team, right. a lot of huge brands to the sec. If you were to add Florida state to the sec, what that would bring would add to the sec. Because again, I mean, you look at Florida state versus LSU last year was 9.17 million Ooh. viewers. Man. Uh, you know, even, even when we played Florida, it was five over 5.07 million viewers and they suck. You know what I mean? Everybody just tuned in to see if we were going to (laughs) lose. And it was 6.71 million in 2022 against Florida. And there really wasn't anything on the line then, like a playoff spot. So really, and when I went back and looked, when you look at what Florida State against good SEC opponents, you know, you're not playing ACC. And and the rankings that we talked about, the third and the fifth, yeah. Again, that's primarily ACC competition. You might be one or two if if you play good teams. Because Florida State, looking at the TV numbers from the Nielsen ratings, Florida State against good SEC opponents ranked higher than the Iron Bowl, Mm. Michigan versus Penn State, LSU versus Alabama, Texas versus Alabama, OU versus Texas. I mean, they bring the numbers. The numbers are on the screen. So, like, you can't argue that they are a massive TV draw. You know, Florida State, again, drew 9.17 million viewers against LSU. UF versus Utah, which was another game that was played the only game of that night, because I know some people say, well, you played on Sunday, you were the only game. They played Thursday, the only night. They drew 3.19 million. So you drew 6 million more viewers than they did against Utah. So again, man, that's just like UNC versus USC, the kickoff the season last year. Huge rivalry yeah, game, all that game. stuff. Bank of America Stadium, 3.4 million viewers. Wow. So like, again, Florida State just brings numbers to the TV and you can't argue with the numbers. So I think, right. I think it's really interesting. You know, and the last thing I'll say on this is everybody, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you got the easy path with the ACC and all that stuff. Look, man, first off, we've done shows on how the ACC probably isn't as bad as you think it is. It's just not as it's not that as good as the SEC or the Big Ten. Right. But when you look at Florida State over the last 10 years, they are 11 and five against the ACC or excuse me, against the SEC. Five of their wins were against ranked SEC teams. Four of their five losses were against top 15 SEC teams. And that was most of those came in a rebuild. Yep. So they have consistently been competitive. They beat oh, yeah. an SEC champion for the national championship. They beat the SEC West champ and the East champ twice. They can compete. I mean, oh, we yeah. don't play the Big Ten a whole lot, but you have a winning record against Michigan, a winning record against Ohio State, right. USC. You're tied against Penn State. So, like, you you have a lot of, of evidence to why you can compete in those conferences. Oh, yeah. And let's be honest, man, you can make it with the new layout. You can make it in the playoffs as a 10 and two SEC team. That's so right. you don't have to go in there and kick That's everybody's right. teeth in. That's right. So I think, I think they can compete. I think that they are a big enough draw that ESPN, I don't think ESPN wants to lose Florida State. I, oh, I think yeah. that that's not being talked about enough. I think the That's Big right. Ten and, and ESPN both want them, but I think ESPN doesn't want to lose Florida State because no. that's a big draw to lose. And Clemson, it's still a really big draw. They just kind of need to be peaking to get that big draw. Correct. You know, people yep. watch Florida State regardless. But regardless, yeah. When Clemson's good, they're hot. But- Florida State could go zero and twelve. 
And it would still have three to four million views per game because Florida State, I mean, like Mike Norvell said in his open press conference, it's an iconic brand. I mean, it's the home of I, I know he's a caller. He's a you know, we don't like him very much, but I mean, right. it's the home of showboat. It's the home of primetime. It's the home of so many uh, Brooks. I mean, just all these players that really brought the attention to Florida State. And now it's this brand that everybody right. that isn't a hater wants to be a part of they're going to watch and if they're a hater they want to see Florida State lose so what right. guess what they're gonna want to watch like it's iconic it attracts people Clemson love you little bro but you don't have the same pull you're only watchable when you're good if Clemson goes in a downspin over the next 10 years I guarantee you that number dips Florida State could go in a downspin and it'll still draw eyes to it that's the difference between why one, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think ESPN wants to lose Florida State. They understand Florida State is a money maker. And so right. I think, again, they're just quietly doing what they're supposed to do. 2025 comes, or if FSU is able, the courts are able to get FSU out of this thing. Man, I I, the, I believe there's going to be a bidding war. Now, I believe, just based on what we've read out there, that Florida State already has probably a a unwritten behind yep. the scenes handshake deal to one of these conferences. You can allege it's the Big Ten. I'll let you allege whatever you want. I believe there's going to be a bidding war because once FSU is free of the ACC, this is the this is honestly outside of Clemson and North Carolina. This is honestly the last big prize out there. Right, and Notre Dame. It. Yeah, Notre, Notre Dame, Dame. Is, is probably the last well, one who I, I think will end up joining the Big Ten once. Yeah. The Big Ten has basically their entire schedule in their yeah. conference. All they have to do is say, look, man, you don't have a schedule if you don't join the Big Ten. That's right. And, That's and right. they literally have a clause in the Big Ten contract. I think it's called the Notre Dame clause, where if they join, there's certain um, – I read this the other day. There's a certain amount of money that's allotted put to the side where if Notre Dame says, I want to join, they have to unlock that option. Wow. So they they literally have it written in the contract for Notre Dame to join. So, yeah, man, I think if they could go out and get Notre Dame and Florida State, that takes two really Oof. massive pieces off the board. And, and if yep. I can find these numbers, Yep. What Florida State does against the SEC. I guarantee you the bean counters at ESPN Absolutely. know the draw that Florida State has. And, you know, when you talk about Clemson, I get it. They propped this conference up for the last five they or did. so years yes. until Florida State got better. But you also have to remember, they dominated this conference early in their lifespan. And then when Florida State joined, Florida State has literally won twice as many ACC titles since they joined. Clemson went almost two decades without winning an ACC title Correct. after FSU joined. So, you know, we really have carried this conference through, yes. throughout the entire time. And that's not to sound arrogant. No. The numbers are what they are. Sure. You know, and like you said, even if we went 0-12, hopefully that never happens. No, we, tried, we got We got close a few times. Uh, <laughs> but Or it felt like we were trying to. But even then, like, you know, like you said, you're going to draw 4 million. And it might be 2 million haters, but that, that's right. fine. You know, people are still watching. So, yeah, man, it's, it's interesting. Things are starting to heat up a little bit. And, you know, I, I do think that this is going to drag out. I think this is going to yeah. continue to play out in court. Nothing ever happens fast through the legal system but i think florida state's going to be in a different conference in 2025 yeah. I, no matter who it is i think they're going to be out of the acc by 2025 especially knowing that that option date like that yeah. is that's massive man that's just huge. huge it is huge but you know what man you know what else is huge getting great fsu gear you Ooh, love that's a, at, that's, that's the biggest thing ever it, and you know what else? You can get it at a great price. And you don't Ooh. even have to go to court to get it. All you got to do sell. is you, I'm all in. you got to Tell me where to go. Just use code SPEAR okay. anytime you visit Alumni Hall FSU. They got everything you want from gifts to gear, all the different sports, softball, basketball, baseball. They got something for everybody. Every Seminole on the list will love 1415 Timber Lane Road in Tallahassee or shop online at Alumni Hall FSU, and they will get you taken care of. 10% off with Code Spear. Thank you for supporting those that support us. So the next thing we need to talk about, Michael, is this spring football camp. Okay. We are about a third of the way through now. They just had their first uh, spring scrimmage. So the first thing I think we need to cover is the news that Mike Norvell said there are three players right now that we know of that are going to be out for the entire spring session. Yep. That is Robert Scott, who we know was already out for basically most of last year, did play spot duty here and there when he was available, uh, dealing with a lingering issue there. You know, you love him. You want him to be a part of the thing. You just don't know how healthy he's going to be. I think you need to start shopping for like a viable replacement there if he's yeah. not available. Uh, Joshua Farmer, this one was an eyebrow raiser. This one yeah. was like, oh, oh, that's not good. But it did sound like his injury was the most promising. Now, we know FSU doesn't release details on injuries, right. but he did make it sound like 
uh, Joshua would be back for fall camp. So that's encouraging because off of this list, this is the one you need the most to right. be available. Uh, and then lastly is Jamari Howard, a young and upcoming player who sounds like his injury may be the worst of the group. Sounds like yeah, it's going to drag yeah. into the season, which it, it stinks yep. because he is an up and coming young guy who could be a contributor, but you probably weren't relying on him. So if you had one that was going to drag into the season, I think, I think that's probably the best one of the group, but we wish those guys a uh, speedy recovery and to get back to camp. But those are three names that are going to be out for the rest of spring. Now looking at these scrimmage notes, it sounds like from, from reading practice reports and what we were able to see and listen to Mike Novell's press conference, it sounds like defense did win the day. Right. But it doesn't sound like offense was that bad. And it sounds no. like they have looked crisp in practice. And you would expect defense to be ahead early exactly. in camp. There's yeah. less install. There's more just line it up and go. There, there's a few things uh, why you would expect that. But it doesn't sound like they were so far ahead because the offense was bad. It just sounds like a natural progression through camp. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and the thing is, you, you you wouldn't want it any other way. You don't want the offense dominating the defense early in camp. That's a bad sign. We've had right. practice reports like that before, and you're like, uh, and then you would see it in the season how bad the defense was. Right. So you want the defense to dominate because they, I mean, they're returning, you know, several uh several returners, right? They they already have the leg up, whereas the offense is is and in a lot of ways, you're piecing together a, a new offense, not not yeah play calling but just new player new wise yeah player wise new components you're plugging playing people right now and so scheme wise all of those things but like you said also according to those practice reports and things we were to heal here and of course mike norville's uh post game co or post scrimmage comments it sounded like the offense really did get uh some chances to to make uh make some impact i know malik benson had a had a big play cam davis had a big play landon thomas uh uh lawrence uh uh, McCoy and of course, Jalen Lucas. Now, let me just say this real quick, and I'll throw this back to you, Jesse. The videos I saw of that little, I'm telling you what, man, I'm telling you what, listen, he's not gonna take starter reps at wide receiver, uh, from anybody, but man, it would be a travesty, it would be a mishandling of this football offense team if you do not find a way to get the ball in Jalen Lucas's hands. Oh my goodness, that dude is a blur. Yeah, I think coming out of the backfield as running back and, and as a return man, you really, really like what you have. And, and I have that down as a note here too, where it looks like Jalen Lucas continues to be who yes. you wanted him to yes. be, not even who you expected, who you hoped that he could right. be. I mean, you you heard initially, it's like, all right, man, we're taking a 5'8 running back from Indiana. Hmm, okay, well, you know, whatever, trust the yep. evaluation or whatnot. Yeah. Then you see it. Then you watch, and you're like, okay, man, this guy has, like, elite-level change of direction and quickness. His speed is what you would hope it to be. Yeah. He's been working at kick and punt returns, so you get kind of a, a triple threat there as, as kick, punt, and which – who knows what kickoff's going to look yeah, like, man? Yep. We're, we're going XFL style in the NFL. It's probably going to work its way down to college, but <laughs> probably will. But that may be good because then you can use a guy like Jalen Lucas more often because you have you have less touchbacks, more returns. But yeah, man, I, I think he's one of the ones that that you're probably most excited about. That may be one of those portal gems that the staff has been known for. This may have been one right. that you go get that that's a really big contributor. Now, some of the other notes that I have as well, the quarterbacks were okay. Yeah. Not not great, not bad about where you want them to be for a newcomer and a bunch of young guys. That's right. pretty much what you have to keep in mind when you look at this quarterback room. Luke Cromanhawk was praised for performing well in his first yeah. scrimmage, which is very encouraging to hear. It, it seems like, man, he is going to turn out to be the guy that you you thought he could be. He has really only had a lot of positives so far, and that's exciting. And that leads me into DJU, who at times is not been perfect, but – from what they say, he has ran the offense really well for a newcomer. Yeah. He's impressive with throws on the move. And he's, he moves well for guys 255 pounds. That's a, yeah. that's a freaking massive quarterback. Now, yeah. that's the biggest quarterback Norvell's had in the system. So I'm excited to see how they use a guy who's yeah. going to be hard to bring down. Is still kind of elusive because I, I went back and looked it up because, of course, Miami fans were like trying to say you have a DN at quarterback or whatnot. Like, yeah, he's the size of a DN. Yeah, he's, yeah. But I looked at your court, we're gonna right, your team. Exactly. But the thing is with DJU at 255, I went back and looked it up what he did against Miami because they yeah. were the ones spouting off. 
you know, he was 6'4", 235, and he ran over 100 times that year at Clemson. He ran all over Miami's defense. Yes, he did. So it's kind of like, yeah, man, as long as he carries it well and he uses it well, I don't right. – it doesn't really matter to me. You know, right. as long as he – it's functional strength, like we talked about before. As long right. as he carries it well, it's not a huge deal to me. Now, on a quick side note, man, I am seriously, seriously, seriously rooting for DJU this year because man. I posted something on our social media channel the other day about DJU and just a first look at him in camp and man like Clemson fans like Clemson. they're a nice bunch bunch of Clemsons that's a hating ass fan base man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they like they came out of the woodwork to comment on this thread and just basically just throw shade on DJ the entire time there's like 400 comments on on this post and I'd say 200 of them were hating on DJ so it's mm. like man it's like it's like you can't your ex wasn't happy with you so now you don't want him to be happy anywhere else like, exactly man, he don't have anything to do with you except for one game of the year. Why are you so worried about what he's right. doing in Tallahassee? Like your passing offense hasn't gotten much better. So maybe you should worry about how things are going right up there with Dabo and the boys. But man, I, I'm really cheering for DJU this year. I, I hope he at least gets the chance to beat Clemson. Uh, but he seems like really so far, I will say this. And, and I know there's some angst with DJ. We talked about that on the last episode. I think he's being what you need. I think he's yeah. being what you brought him in for. He's a high floor guy with a lot of experience. Yeah who has all the talent in the world to be one of these high-profile quarterbacks. Right. He just hasn't quite done it yet in his career, but he's bridging that gap to those young quarterbacks That's that right. you have heard nothing but positives That's about. Right. The Luke Cromanhawks, the Brock Glens, you keep hearing all this stuff. They're just not ready yet because Fair we enough. know Brock Glenn missed a lot of time last year and Cromanhawks still a freshman. So he's giving you what you need at the position. Right, right, absolutely. He he he's going to be a great bridge to to this quarterback program and this quarterback room. And so you want to allow uh, for those younger guys to develop, to fight. I mean, let me tell you, that's going to be a, a a heck of a competition next season because, oh, like man. you, I've heard yeah. the same thing about Cromerhart. I mean, oh my goodness, and and another year where Brock hopefully gets the whole year to to improve. It's going to be a great thing. But I think with DJ, listen, it's early in the spring, you. You knew coming in that he had some of these things, the accuracy issue, short and medium. It's going to take time for Mike Norvell and for yep. Tony Tokras to work what they do to for the development process. You don't want them to figure this fully out in the spring. Like the, you, you want to see that progression. And right. I would I would imagine that by fall camp comes around when fall camp gets here. You're going to start hearing things about DJ of like, man, he's he's completing better passes or or they're at least leveraging the offense in a much better way to allow him to be more accurate. Like, I think those things are going to come. And so I wouldn't be so disheartened right now with if you're reading or hearing on Twitter space or or wherever you're get, you're getting your practice updates for spring practice. I wouldn't be disheartened by, oh, well, he, he didn't have the best of days. He had a solid day. Don't. Don't let that deter you. Remember what the proof is in the pudding. They've proven that they are they can work with these quarterbacks. They can get them up to where they need to be. And uh I I, I suspect that by fall, I'm not saying he's gonna be perfect, but I suspect right. that a lot of those concerns that we might uh begin to have here will be subsided by the time we get to fall camp. Right. And and we knew when he came in that he needed some development. We knew he right. had some work. We just knew there was a lot of untapped potential in there that right. we thought this staff could bring out of him. So like you said, you just want to see him have more good days than bad. And then right. you want to see him have that progression into right. the fall. And you need him to peak at the right time. And again, that's not to say that he had a bad day. It's just right. it, it didn't sound like it was it, it's stellar. It's just kind of right. what you expect. Solid from, day. Right. From him. Right. And so some of the other notes that I have here, like you touched on, Malik Benson had a touchdown. So I think it's good you're seeing him obviously emerge as that guy. It sounds like Hakeem Williams, man, in that post-practice video he did the other day, I mean, he just looks so physically yes. impressive now. Like he is. He looks like he's physically ready. But the reports say that there's still a little inconsistency with some drops right. and things like that. But it sounds like the staff is really pushing him to be ready for the season because I think right. they know for Florida State to be where they want to be, they need a receiver of yep. that caliber to be hitting yep. his stride. So I think that is someone that they're really trying to push to get ready for the season. And, I mean, again, he looks just totally physically different from last year. And yep. we saw flashes of what he could be last year. So if you can kind of get everything meshing at the same time, that's going to be a guy to reckon, a force to reckon yep. with in, in the ACC. But 
The last note I have on offense here uh, was Jeremiah Byers has been a guy who's been praised for making a really big jump from last year to this year. And remember, he came in from a G5 school, I think yeah. it was UTSA. So yep. you knew there was probably going to be a little bit of an adjustment period there. We saw some really good moments from him. We yeah, saw we some very not good moments from him. Yep. You know, but I, I think just the fact that he's made that adjustment and he's going to be a piece that you can rely on this year will be good. Some of the younger offensive linemen are stepping up as well, which will provide you with that added depth. Uh, Lucas Simmons is a name that keeps popping up on, on reports and yeah. things like that. And then looking at the defense, not not quite as many notes here, but the DN depth seems to be better than expected. We already thought it was going to be yeah. really good, but it sounds like you've now had Jaden Jones emerge who's a guy that came in from Juco. He's got incredible size, but was coming off a knee injury, had a surgery there, just didn't get healthy in time for the yeah. season. Aaron Hester, another young defensive end yeah. who is emerging, and he's, his name keeps getting mentioned over and over yeah. and over. And usually these guys that keep their yep. name keeps popping up, they're ready to contribute. You've also heard Byron Turner Jr. has really taken a big step yes. this year. You know, yes. last year he got his biggest work size yep. in, the, in last season, and it was still kind of like, you know, he's, He's a pretty decent backup, kind of what you had in, in Gilbert Edmond. But it seems like he's taking that extra step now. Yep. So, man, I mean, you literally have like eight defensive ends yes. that can contribute. Now, you got to keep them in the boat. That's right. That's right. So, That's so right. you never know who you may get or lose, especially with, you know, all the transfer rules basically out the window. But, man, your defensive end depth is probably one of the best in the country. Yeah. Uh, Grady Kelly might just be Fisk 2.0. He keeps what? popping off with, with a lot of, you know, good, positive things. Maybe not. I, that's big shoes to fill. Because, I mean, Brady, Brady Fisk was an, an, a man-child. That was an animal. But I think Grady Kelly is at least being reported as maybe being better than some of us thought in the beginning. When you hear Colorado State, you know, you're kind of like, yeah, all right, maybe we're trying to capture lightning in a bottle twice. Right. Sounds like they might have done it. Well, like... <clears throat> I, so I, I don't know what you've heard out there, Jesse. I've heard mixed reports. Nothing that says he's bad. Nothing that says that he's right. been bad. More so, the reports really kind of like average out to basically he's going to be somebody who plugs a hole on that defensive line. Like, you know, he's going to be able to stop the run. You, like, he's going to be able to get in the gaps, stop the run, right? But then on the other side, it's like not as, you know, I heard someone say the other day, like, you know, we should probably pump the brakes on him being fist 2.0, as you say, or, you know, and I was the I was the one that was saying, like, oh, I think this guy could be right, uh, it right. better or be just as good as Braden Fist. Like he just ha he just has that look and that feel that we had when Braden Fist comes in. So I was a little disappointed to kind of hear that, like, oh, you know, he's a good player, but he may not be like the thing we're all hoping that another i mean because brain fist was not just a plugger he was a disruptor right yeah yeah and so to to say that you know that it seems like the ceiling for grady is a plugger i mean that's not bad you need those but i i was just and and again just like with dju that this is early in the spring so right. there's more development there's more workouts there's more strength and conditioning that's coming and then there's fall camp and maybe by fall camp we might see a, a a more heightened, more uh, a more disruptive version of Grady Kelly because I do think that's going to be important. I mean, you didn't go to Colorado State just to get a plugger, so I th I think the coaches see something more in him. It, they just got to pull it out of him. Yeah, I think he's got the frame, he's got the size, and he moves well. I, I yes. think you know, and I've heard a lot of positive as well. So I, I think it's really one where like. You know, when he when they first got him, we compared him to Malcolm Ray. Yeah. The size was yeah. almost equivalent. The production was very, you know, similar and stuff like that. So I really think with Grady Kelly, it's kind of like if your floor is Malcolm Ray and your ceiling is Braden Fisk, anywhere in between, in between. is a win. <laughs> yes. You yeah. Know, because because right now you know you have your top two and you just need to fill two and or, or three and four. And yep. it sounds like Daniel Lyons might be your number four who's developing yeah. well yep. as another young defensive tackle. Uh the linebackers got some praise. DJ Lundy was was praised by Mike Norvell in his post uh scrimmage comments. Moves very well. Blake Nicholson is also a guy that that yeah. got some compliments, which is also really good to hear because that's the guy you kind of wanted to see take that next right. step. It just kind of seems like they're still searching for the pecking order behind DJ Lundy. Who's going to yeah. be the two and the three linebacker to step up? And it kind of also sounds similar to the secondary, where you basically have a couple of locks. Right. It sounds like Fentrell Cypress, uh, Azaria Thomas, and Shaheen Brown 
not only does it sound like they're they're locks because they're your most veteran guys, they're returning and all that stuff, but it right. sounds like they have actually really taken really? a step forward yes. this year. Like, yeah. like they went from good to great this year. So it sounds like you have three really good DBs. Now you just got to start plugging holes. You yeah. got to fill the other safety spot. You got to get that nickel spot, which we already know probably who it's going to be right. between Greedy Vance and and uh, the Earl Little. Yeah. But it does sound like you have three really solid DBs. You just have to figure out the, the yeah. order after that. And it sounds like you have a lot of young DBs who are really performing well. It's just, you know, finding who is ready to either step up or do you have a veteran guy you turn yeah. to or something like that. Yeah, so you it, see, it's going to be you, interesting. You, yeah, you've seen that, like, if you follow Adam Fuller on, on X or Twitter, um, you know, he posts those mission takeaways. And yep. uh, my boy Ashlyn Barker got a, uh, a takeaway the other day. I saw that. I celebrated. I was like, let's go. So, you know, we'll see, man. These DBs, they're, you know, they're, man, I I just think we have a just a deep group of DBs that, that they're going to, some of them that are even young are going to find their they're going to yeah. find their way on the field this season. It may not be a lot, but they're going to find their way. Uh, it's just such a deep and talented uh, a group of DBs back there. Right. I agree. And I even saw Devontae Brown had a pick yes. takeaway. And, you know, I, I, I tweeted, retweeted him and I said, man, I think people really are underestimating what Devontae yep. Brown can be. He was really good at UCF, transitioned to safety at Miami. We saw Cam Kitchens, like he regressed at Miami. He yep. was an all ACC caliber safety. So, like, give him some time yeah. with, with the staff and, and with Patrick Sertan and let, let them work on him. I think there's That's some right. guys, you know, and I had made a comment where I thought we weren't as, as, deep at corner as you thought but the what i said in that and because it got misinterpreted in the con in the uh, comment section was that it's not that we're not deep it's just you're you're thin with experience once exactly. you get past about three or four guys you just have a lot of talented young guys and That's so right. you just want to see like is it the guys from this freshman class like a charles right. lesser that can step in do you have guys from the the last class like a quindarius jones that can step right. in that, that has flashed a few times well so i think that's really what they're trying to figure out but that again is what spring is for this is just the first scrimmage but there's a lot of positives coming out of there man I, i'm really encouraged by what they're doing in spring i think they're getting ahead of the game mike novell even said this is one of the earliest scrimmages he's ever had uh, as his time as a coach, but they're really pushing these guys to get ahead of the curve, to get installed with, with all the things that they got going on, because I think they know what's at stake this year. Yeah. I think they know how big this year is, you know, and talking about all this lawsuit stuff, the national spotlight is on you. So yep, you, you right. have to go out there and perform or everyone's going to think you look silly, yep. you know? So, so there's a big season ahead and man, I, I'm just really excited as we progress through spring. Like we said, we got a lot more coming up that, that we're going to be talking about when spring comes up. we got a special show coming up Let's go. for you guys where we're going to talk about some spring coming up in about two weeks. We're going to have a former 2013 national champion join the show as a special guest to talk about spring so you guys make sure you stay tuned for that it's going to be on april the 10th uh we're also going to announce a new partnership that we have that should Let's help go. us take this thing to the next level uh that we're going to be announcing the date hopefully the the launch date is the day before on april the 9th so keep an eye out for those uh just wanted to throw that in there for you guys now the last thing i want to touch on is baseball's bounce back we had Let's not go. talked to you guys since the Clemson meltdown and look, man, it was painful to watch. It, it was, but uh, just kind of reading around the, the Florida state community and things like that. I think there was a couple of, of people that piled on this team a little too early yeah, yeah. after that, after that Clemson series, because yeah, man, it was really hard to stomach watching that. I, I get it. It was painful to watch. Not so much that like the, the first game was hard to watch because you got run rule. That was tough. Right. That was tough. I think that the next two were, were harder to watch because you had the game one right, twice right, and right. you let it get away. But I think the, the takeaway from the Clemson series was you saw them put a top five team on the ropes twice, twice. So it's there, whatever the, the stuff is there. You just have to figure out how to close these games out. You have to figure out how, and, and for what right. it's worth, you know, again, baseball is a crazy sport. Miami just, just walk off. They walked off Clemson last night. Matter of fact, mm. Um, and, and Miami's not having the greatest year. So I think it is. There's things to be encouraged about from that Clemson series. Right. Yes, it stinks that you basically handed them a series win over right. a top five team that would have put you first in the ACC. That's the painful part. But it's a long season. It's early. And I think what's the most encouraging is the way they responded. I was worried after two losses in a row like that. It would. Yeah. How does this team respond? Because yep. last year we saw them start hot and then fold. Right. Completely. 
And so you were worried about it. It felt like the wind had been taken out of the sails. You were the last undefeated team and all this stuff and, and all that went away. But then they bounced back against Florida in a big way. Yeah. Like you said, they, they ended up, I mean, just kind of whooping them. Now I understand, <laughs> which gives you the series win for the year because That's now right. you've won two games. Now I know it's midweek. I know Florida, goodness gracious. They, I didn't, I didn't know they had so many pitchers. They were like literally <laughs> letting people out of the stands pitch. You know, <laughs> It's crazy. So you're not getting their starters, and I understand right. that. But but this is the same Florida team. Like, yeah, the pitching is is a huge component, but it's the same batters. It's the same people that's swinging the bats. Yep, yep. And they just beat LSU in a yep. series. So like, that's huge to come back and get that win in a dominant fashion. And then last night you beat Louisville. You go yeah. ahead and and you get game one of the series. Hopefully they can clinch that series tonight on Friday night, depending on when you're watching this. Because you had Louisville, you have Boston College, your next weekend series after that. I think you have Jacksonville as your next midweek. So you have a couple of series here. Miami's coming up after that. Well, mm -hmm. I think you can you can get that series. Yeah. You didn't want them to fold at a time you had very winnable series coming That's up. Right. And so now That's that right. they seem back on track, I, I think really, and we talked about this the other day, I, I think really with that Clemson series, you just saw like Cam Leiter struggled off the mound. Right. You need your starters because the bullpen and, and I love the bullpen, man. They they responded. They heard the talk about how they let they allowed that collapse, and then they bounced right back, right, and and ended up having a good showing against Florida and another really good showing against Louisville. But I think when you have a bullpen that can be inconsistent at times, you need those starting pitchers who we know are really good. To they need right. to give you five to six good innings. Yep. yep. And we saw Cam Leiter wasn't able to give you that in that first yeah. Clemson game yep. when they got they got run ruled. But last night against uh, Louisville, he went I think six and a third maybe yeah. or something like that. Had twelve strikeouts. Yeah. And then you bring in you bring in your bullpen pitcher. Now one of them came and went pretty quick, but then they brought in uh, Charles who got another five or four strikeouts. So they had sixteen combined strikeouts. So man, I I think really they rebounded very well and it was very encouraging to see them kind of pick the momentum pick the yeah. pieces back up and not yeah. let that series cost them other games yeah absolutely listen uh, i heard a coach once said this you know i've coached i've played sports you've coached you've you know whatever um i've heard a coach say you know look when there's games when there's games in front of you when you have a long season ahead you know you either win or you learn that's yep. what it is you win or you learn and so Florida State walks into that Clemson game. We all walked into the Clemson series just wanting to learn more about, okay, is this is this team legit? And, you know, they what they hit a grand slam uh, right up top. They were up 4 nothing against Clemson, and, and Cam didn't have a great pitching game. And so they got run rule. You, you kind of figured, okay, that, that happens. You're going right. to have a bad game here or there. Then to be up. What was it? Eight one in the bottom yeah. of the ninth, Good. and then with like two outs, with two yeah, outs to go, and then your bullpen melts down. Okay, so you learn, you learn. Okay, so our bullpen is not necessarily, or at least those arms that came out were not necessarily ready for the moment. Then you're up eleven two in the bottom of the six, right? I think late six yeah. inning, and you let them come back because the bullpen melt down again, and so you walked out of that hoping to learn a couple things. One. Okay, so the arms that we use, was it the situation? Was it the moment? Is there something else? And then also, how are they going to respond? Now, yeah. we the immediate game was Florida. Yes, you're playing the midweek, but like you said, great point. Same bats, yep. same situation. It's a right, it's more a rival, right? Yeah. Uh uh that we're playing either Florida. And to run rule them, to shut them down. To, to have your bullpen step up in those moments, not only did you win, but you learn that they have resiliency, that yep. they can bounce back. Then to come in, to start the Louisville series, I think the final score was 8-3, yep. um, and to, to do that again. So um, you see that resiliency and that bounce backness um, attitude being built. Man, but what I love about this uh Florida State baseball team is they have a what I'm calling a come get you some attitude. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> like okay, yeah, we we struggle, but come get you some cuz we about to put it on you. And I mean, my goodness. You talk about and this is the this is a type of team, especially offensively, that can get you far. I'm not going to predict any I'm not going to jinx say anything about where it can get you far. 
farther. And if this starting if the if the starters can get you five to six innings and that bullpen can be consistent, they're gonna right. blow some other games. Let's just be real. It's baseball, it happens. Right. They're gonna blow some games. But if they can be consistent enough with this come get you some attitude, man, there there's no telling how far this baseball team can go. Right. And Link Jarrett even said it was one of the most impressive responses that he's seen from any yep. team that he's ever coached. And again, man, like, like we said, baseball is a crazy sport. That same Clemson team. First off, you have to remember they're a top five team for That's a right. reason. They're like number three in one poll, number four in one poll. So they've earned the right to be up where they're at. It, you knew that was going to be a tough ask right. anyway to go up there and win that series. Baseball's a crazy game. That that same Clemson team got beat 18 to one by Kennesaw State. I mean, <laughs> cra crazy things happen in baseball. But I, you know, we had said where like if they go up there, they win one, you feel like, okay, good on you. If you win two, okay, we're looking really good. If you yeah. sweep them, we're booking our tickets to Omaha. <laughs> That's right. Unfortunately, the worst case scenario happened and you got swept. But I feel like it, it was as painful as a sweep as it was. It was still encouraging because you yep. saw them jump out on, on Clemson twice. They very easily could have won that series. They were literally one out they from were. winning one of the games. So, I mean, like you, you, you got as close to getting a series win without getting the series win. So I think it shows you that they can hang with those teams. But, you know, again, you just got to find a way to be more consistent and continue to develop your arms in the bullpen throughout the season. But, man, I just really do feel like the sky is the limit with this team. Like we said, you got – you know, you you got Louisville, Boston College, JU, you got uh, Miami coming up. So you have yeah. some very winnable. Yep. And Clemson is probably the best team on, on your schedule from yeah. the ACC. So you have some very winnable series coming up. You know, and, and I feel like they they have rebounded already, but they're going to get it right, man. And this yeah. team is going to really make some noise going throughout the rest of the season. Softball also picked up a big win against NC State as well. And uh, so, yeah, man, it, that's, that's pretty much what I just want to talk about a few minutes on baseball because – you know, like we said, we didn't get to talk since that Clemson. That's right. Uh, that Clemson series, and I really am inspired by the way that they were able to rebound yes. and go out and beat Florida. Because yes. you know, you felt like it was like, okay, man, if they lose to Florida, we Oof. might we might be heading a different direction. But they yeah. responded in a big way, and that, and yeah. that was huge, man. So just super proud of those guys, yeah. and hopefully they can clinch that series win against Louisville tonight. Yep. And and keep things rolling. So with that being said, guys, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Just wanted to touch base with you guys on everything going on around Tallahassee, the lawsuit, Florida State. There's a lot of buzz in the air right now, so just catching so up with you guys. Right, and then like we said, we got some big things coming up real soon in the next few weeks for you guys, so stay tuned with that. Uh, be on the lookout for that episode. I'm not I'm not going not gonna to drop who yet, but we're, no, it's, no, no, coming. No, no. it's coming up. But I'm, I'm super excited about uh, that episode as well as the new partnership coming up. So again, guys, as always, check out Alumni Hall FSU to get a great selection of FSU gear at a great price with Code Spear. Thank you so much for supporting those that support us. And as always, guys, we will catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching and go Knowles. Go